Okay, let's make a start. Good morning. My name's Gavin Bridge. I'm from Durham University in the UK, and I'm the editor of Transactions of the Institute of British Geographers. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it is a gorgeous day outside in a wonderful city, uh, so I very much appreciate you coming to this plenary conversational event. I will explain the format of this plenary conversation and the rationale for it, and I'll also introduce our conversationalists in a moment. But if you'll allow me, I just want to say a couple of things about Transactions, which is sponsoring this event. So Transactions is the flagship journal of the Royal Geographical Society Institute of British Geographers. It is an international journal, and it publishes leading geographical scholarship, across the spectrum of ge geographical research and from wherever in the world that work originates. It aims to publish landmark pieces, pieces that make a substantial contribution theoretically, empirically, methodologically to advancing the discipline. And it's been my privilege since uh, taking on the role of editor a few years ago to work with the International Editorial Board, to work with authors, to work with reviewers and to work with the society and with Wiley, the publishers, uh, to bring that uh, journal into production. And I want publicly to be able to thank the intellectual labor and support that all those constituencies provide. And because Transactions is an international journal, I've been keen to work with the editorial board to reach out to subdisciplinary communities like this at global gatherings. So I was very pleased to have the opportunity to work with Derek uh, to bring about this plenary conversation. If you haven't looked at transactions recently, please do. Here's a few things to whet your appetite. Thank you, Henry. As you may find on your chairs, um, a flyer for a virtual issue of the Journal on Financial Geographies that Manuel Elbers, a member of the editorial board, put together. And that tells the story of financial geography as read through the archive of the transactions. And Manuel has provided a commentary and a reflection on what that story can tell us about the nature of financial geographies today. Recent issues, just to flag up a few things, include work on the geographical imagination and technological connectivity in East Africa. It includes work on the capitalist production of uneven bodies through a focus on motherhood, milk, and food production in the 19th century. It includes work on contemporary macroeconomic integration and frontiers of economic activity and governance. And it includes, includes work on the Chinese telecom, telecom sector and its interpenetration with global financial networks. There are more, of course, in the pipeline. I should also just flag up briefly that the forthcoming issue will include the plenary lecture from the last international RGSIBG conference, which was given by Vinay Guidwani from Minnesota, in which he outlines an infra-economy of waste and value production in the informal sector in India. A really rich piece of work coming out in the next issue. So, a conversation. When we were thinking about what to do at this global gathering, the idea of a conversation came to mind. Why a conversation? Well, a conversation, first of all, is a very human way of exchanging with people, an everyday mode of exchange. Yet, rarely is it a formal part of conferences, which tend to be set up around keynotes, around panels, and around paper sessions. So there's an interest, then, in trying to diversify the ways in which we exchange and share and communicate at major events like this. So this is, then, self-consciously an experiment and I appreciate and applaud the courage of my fellow panelists here and you, indeed, for being part of that experiment. Of course, conversation is also central to a mode of engaged pluralism that Trevor Barnes and Eric Shepard wrote about in that piece in Progress in Human Geography in 2010. 
that that form of conversation can be a way to overcome what they refer to as the many solitudes that can sometimes characterize subdisciplines. And the essence then of conversation is an exchange in order, a dialogue, in order to grasp and understand difference. And I would suggest then that it's also a conversational mode is very consistent with a way of working in the sub substantivist tradition, the substantivist epistemology that Jamie Peck laid out for us in that opening remarks, in his opening remarks at the Pitt Rivers Natural History Museum on Wednesday night. Of course, a hallmark of that approach is comparison and working across difference, and conversation can be one way to do that. Okay, so that's conversation. So what's this conversation about? Well, it's about what is at stake in the development of a global economic geography. And this is where I think we all, and by we, I think I mean you, have a stake in what we're about to do now because we all have something to say on what it means to develop a global economic geography. So what we're gonna do is focus the conversation around a handful of issues and these revolve around how we encounter and work with others, how we co-produce, to use the language that Wendy Lana used in the last RGS IBG conference to frame those overarching discussions, the co-production of knowledge of economies in this case. And I think there's three particular things that between us we've decided we would like to anchor our conversation around. And the first of these is about opportunities of that encounter for novel subjects, new spaces of inquiry, and perhaps alternative epistemologies that working with others enables us to encounter those things. But of course, there's always also a set of tensions, aren't there, between a pluralism that valorizes difference, that kind of revels in its difference, and also, the, at the same time, the need to, develop share, the need to develop shared agendas in order to build, to codify, and heavens above, to test the knowledge that we're generating. And thirdly, there are questions about the extent to which what we do collectively is up to the task of transformation, to pick up on the title of the conference, Mapping Economies in for Transformation. So there's a sense here in which the work that we do in identifying, problematizing, and addressing matters of social significance are our approaches, are our concepts up to the task. So in my own work, for example, which focuses on resource economies and environmental economies, I'm asking myself questions about what it means to practice economic geography in the Anthropocene. For others, it may be about what it means to practice economic geography at times of austerity or at times of extensive uh, migrant economies of migrant labor, for example. So what we've done, I've invited my colleagues here at the table to explore these themes from a situated perspective. That always seems to be the best way to engage a conversation, have people talk about their experience, um, and to try and understand these three issues from that kind of lived, experienced perspective. Okay. So let me just briefly introduce them. Um, on my right, Britta Klag. Britta is Professor of Geography at the University of Bonn in Germany and previously held positions at the Universities of Bremen, Hamburg and Osnabrück. Britta publishes widely in um, English and in German languages, and her recent work on the geographies of finance and energy uh, looks at the intersection of financing for renewable energy projects. So, for example, she's done some work looking at the emergence of the global wind industry from an evolutionary economic geography perspective, and the role of public policies and innovation networks in driving the sector's shift from essentially a North European centre of gravity was the shift in turbine manufacturing to, to China. Britta also leads an interdisciplinary working group in the Academy for Spatial Research and Planning in Hanover on policy recommendations around the renewable energy sector. So welcome, Britta. On my left, Jane Pollard. Jane is Professor of Economic Geography in the Center for Urban and Regional Development Studies and the School of Geography, Politics and Sociology at Newcastle University here in the UK. Jane's work on the geographies of money and finance mobilizes post-colonial and feminist epistemologies to suggest alternative ways of conceiving and practicing economic geography. In a recent piece in Progress in Human Geography, for example, she's argued that analyses of financial crisis have much to learn from three decades of feminist scholarship on economic development. Jane also led the economic geography component of an international 
benchmarking exercise on human geography that was commissioned by the UK Research Councils in collaboration with the RGS, IBG. And what that tried to do was to position the nature of economic geography in this particular national context in relation to international um, work around uh, it within economic geography. Welcome, Jane. Our third panelist is Henry Young. Henry is the Professor of Economic Geography at the National University of Singapore, and he's held a string of distinguished visiting and honorary professorships in China, Japan, Australia, and the UK. He's currently director of the JY Pillay Comparative Asia Research Center at NUS's Global Asia Institute. Henry, of course, has been central to the development of the Manchester School of Global Production Networks, Manchester being the place from which uh, Henry earned his PhD. Has made key interventions in relational economic geography, um, in the role of East Asian firms in the development state in the global economy, and the regional development consequences of East Asia's industrial transformation. And amongst many other things, he directs, co-directs the Global Production Network Center at NUS. So welcome, Henry. Okay, so to get us started, what I want to do is to um, ask our panelists here about the nature of working with others. So, Britta, let me come to you first. Um, in the nature of the work that you do, maybe around your work on wind, wind and renewable energy, um, for example, how often do you find yourself in conversation with people who don't identify themselves as economic geography? Well, thank you very much. First, thanks to Gavin as well as Derek for inviting me to this plenary, which um, I took as an opportunity to think about economic geography in a more systematic way. And I had some new and even for me, myself, interesting insights, as well as discussions, which I found enriching. So thanks a lot. Um, talking about conversations and collaborations with other subdisciplines or other disciplines um, beyond geography and in relation to my own research, I was kind of First of all, going back historically, and which is interesting because the first um, collaboration that I had with somebody who was, uh, which, which resulted in a publication was actually with an economist. And this economist is sitting here and is now an economic geographer, partly at least, and it's somebody, some, uh, a person some people might even know, it's Michael Grote sitting here. So that was in the early 90s, that was in financial geography, and it was really funny to kind of think, of back, think back to that time. So when I think about my um, conversations and collaborations and with, with, these, with other researchers um, and I'm wondering what they are dependent on, I think they are very dependent on research topics and on empirical research methods in the first place, second on context and, op and opportunities and third on my personal preferences and probably they are also dependent on how open you are. And with regard to research topics and empirical, re empirical research methods, if we look at financial geography and renewable energies and I could see that the, the pattern is very different. Also, and also so far, and you were also asking whether the, the in, in your before questions you sent us before, whether the topics are at the center or at the margin of economic geography, and both of them used to be at the margins of economic geography, but the financial geography has changed. So in financial geography, I see my conservation, con conversation and collaboration partners a lot of times within economic geography or with other social and economic scientists, both nationally and internationally. But in the course of empirical research, we also talk to people from, um, from the financial sector and policymakers. but while there's exchange, there's not much collaborative work or even productive work together. So, And there's some interest by others as well in these things that you explain to them because financial geography is always something people without, outside the discipline wouldn't understand. So that's interesting. There's some nice encounters I had and they might be important in building bridges, but what I see is that financial geography is still a rather academic endeavor and, and very international. And that's very different um, with renewable energies. It's not so far definitely not at the center of, uh, of the discipline of economic geography. And I have academic con conversations and collaborations um, with economic geographers a little bit, but much more with, um, with people from technical disciplines like planners and engineers with geographers of other brands, cultural, social, political, as well as physical geographers, which I find interesting, and also with social scientists, political and, and economic scientists, much less international, as I already said. But I also had, and that's very important for renewable energies, at least at this, as the state is right now, I had many in-depth conversations and also some collaborations with practitioners and policymakers. 
And that is not only in the course of empirical research, like it is in financial geography, but also under the umbrella of the Academy, uh, German Academy of Spatial Research and um, Planning, the RRL, which a lot of you might know, the German people at least, which is an organi organization that brings together people from academia and practice, and at the same time provides an interdisciplinary forum. And as you mentioned, as a leader of one of those groups, I came in close contact with academics from different disciplines, including all the, all the disciplines I already mentioned, and practitioners from the energy sector, planning, and policy. And that was very enriching, and also it helped to build a expert knowledge, which you need to know, which you need to have to be doing good research. Britta, can, can, I, can I just interject there? Sure, you, sure. You said a number of interesting things. And one of them is you're suggesting that the nature of these collaborations are often, often involves us in different ways. Sometimes that we're, we're engaging with people on what we might characterize as fairly instrumental terms. We want to understand what it, some knowledge that they have, so that can inform our projects. But in other ways, and perhaps this is what's coming through in your work, your engagement with policymakers, um, it's actually a bit more transformative to our own ways of thinking. Is, would that be a, a, an accurate characterization of, of how you have experienced that? I think it's, it's mutually um, transformative because I learn a lot, especially about technical stuff that I hadn't known. But for them, it is also very interesting to hear what our perspectives are. And for them, I'm not only an economic geographer, but often also just a so one social scientist that they tend to uh, that they um, happen to to to, to uh, engage with. So there's kind of I think it's a mutual um, productive thing, and it's kind of interesting also for the practitioners. I think the practitioners are often very uh, keen on talking to academics because they would give them an overview perspective because they often are in their in their little niche and they have their little task but they don't see the big picture and we can help them to get that bigger picture of the whole issue and kind of situate their own work within within the whole for example energy transition in Germany which is kind of a big big project we are pursuing now okay. more or less successful Th thank you very much yeah and Jane please just to build off something that Britta's there uh, said about the nature of interactions with other things um, a lot of my uh, collaborations have been with, I mean, with, within geography, with, say, within, say, people in, who would call themselves development geographers, but beyond that, with people in, say, planning, business, um, uh, feminist economics, uh, and to a lesser extent, maybe sort of area specialists or people, uh, colleagues in law. But one of the things I find interesting about them is um, they will sort of pick me up on my strain, what they see as my strange economic geographical habits or my particular use of language or that we start talking with each other and discover that we're maybe actually talking about very similar things, but we have quite different uses of language um, to describe similar things. So I found the collaborations very interesting in terms of um, making me reflect back on, on um, my own position and why, you know, why I use certain kinds of language or certain kinds of ideas. And I think that, is, again, is also a, a, a sort of very privileged position to be in, in that um, and one of the joys of of being in economic geography, as many people have commented at this conference, is precisely its, its plurality, but it's, it's, it's interest, in, it's, it's in exploration, it's open borders to other disciplines, and its capacity for uh, self-critique and auto-critique and this you know, endless anxiety about what is it, and is it, is it doing enough of what it should do, and should it be talking more to economics, or should it be these things? So um, I think one of the interesting things about my collaborations is then not just dealing with whatever the actual uh, empirical interesting thing is, whether it's uh, the development of Birmingham city centre or the development of Islamic finance, but then thinking back and um, thinking about uh, interest-based finance based on uh, understandings of Islamic finance and reflecting back on other stories that have been told about places which I've been guilty of reproducing in my teaching and now think, well, actually, we need to write our economic geography courses differently because there's different ways of under, you know, writing about things like urban history or whatever. So I think. Can, can I just ask, ask you, to, uh, reflecting on what you've said there, in, in my own encounters, some of which is around energy, where I'm talking with people who know the energy sector very, very well and far better than I do, I often find I'm in the position where I've got a concept that I want to use and I feel that I need to explain that concept better. So it's an issue of trying to communicate the concepts that I'm using to an audience that's not familiar with them. That's one way, that's one thing that happens in those engagements with other people who don't share a language. But then there's something else, which is what I thought, I think you were saying, is that actually it, it, it makes us not just explain better the concepts we're using, but actually changes those concepts. That it makes us think, actually, this concept didn't grasp X or Y, 
but instead it needs to be tweaked, changed, modified, or perhaps thrown out, because it, the understanding that I'm getting from talking to others who don't share that suggests there are real limits to the concept I'm using. Yes, so I think it also may, or is it helped make me more reflective about you know, the baggage that I didn't realise some of the you know, ways of thinking I had that is actually freighted with all sorts of baggage, which actually, what happens if you jettison some of that or um, you know, change your way of thinking about it? So I think it has been, yeah, it is a real opportunity for reflexivity about your, your own suppositions. Yes. yes, okay, thank you. Henry, interested in your thoughts on this, given the range of different others with whom you work in, in, in your many different um, natures of research that you're doing at the moment. Um, okay, I, I, I have been a geographer all the way, ba bachelor in geography and then PhD also in geography, so I'm complete thoroughbred in that sense. Uh, so it's more about kind of me meeting others, reaching out. Um, part of the reason how I started out sort of work, not kind of necessarily working with other disciplined people, but kind of interested in what other disciplined people are doing is because I, I learned from Peter Dickon, my supervisor, that um, we should try to do half of our work outside geography because we shouldn't be just talking to each other. We are quite small. So it's on that basis that I have always been interested in seeking a multidisciplinary audience in my work from day one when I finished uh, my PhD. So I primarily work on uh, firms, network in Asia, taking a more political economy perspective. Uh, I'm interested in development outcome. That's really what I do. So as you can imagine, of course, I will encounter economists, people in business school, certain kind of political scientists and economic sociologists. So I do this, and this is the research side of it. And I also, because of my work with uh, Review International Political Economy, the journal, for seven, eight years, so all my other co-editors are political scientists and sociologists. So because of that, again, I get a strong, strong sort of sense of what they do, and we have to review all the papers together. So we end up fairly interdisciplinary. In that sense. But for today's purpose, we are really talking about research collaboration. So, um, and it's more in our recent work on the global production networks in, in, in NUS. Um, I, I just want to make three quick points. One is to say we have uh, political scientists on our team, economists on our team, and sociologists. Uh, I think what we bring to the table as geographer is that I think somehow we are better read. All right? We are not so sort of intradisciplinary. We read their stuff, so by the time we start, we know some stuff about economics, some stuff about political science and sociology. So I think that is our strength. We are interdisciplinary, kind of by training and or exposure. But of course, the, the, the problem with that is that, is that we often have too many to read. Yeah? So sometimes I always thought it may be easier to be a rational choice game theorist, right? because that's all you do. All right? There is only one thing you do, play games. Yeah? Uh, second is that I think we are as geographers or economic geographers, we are not so hung up with certain dogmatic positions. I think we are willing to change, we are willing to take on new perspectives. So in the interdisciplinary context, I think that's very important. Because uh, our friends in economics, our friends in policy science, feels that we are receptive. Even though they may be dogmatic, we are not as dogmatic as them. So they feel comfort working with us. Particularly those who want to get a bit out of their so-called hardcore, hardcore whatever, hardcore economics, hardcore policy science, and so on. I find that we can gel quite well with our interdisciplinary people. Uh, the final thing is that, the third point is that, I think most of us are not pure theorists. We like to do some theory, but most of us are kind of interested in the empirical happenings. Yeah? We are not, oh, Okay, I'm only interested in doing a model. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah? No, we're not like that, right? I mean, we are geographers. We are always grounded. We want to know what's happening in the world. Yeah? So what we can bring to the table is all of these wonderful suggestions about actually how to understand the real world. Yeah? So I think in, in, in all three respects, uh, we can bring something to the table. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point, Henry, because if, if, if I was, it was useful thinking about these questions because it made me think, what do my collaborators think I do? What, do? what do I bring to the table? And I would think, yes, firstly, they would see me as being interested in the real world as things are going on as opposed to more you know, abstract or technical notions of how finance worked. And I sometimes, you know, I keep pushing people about, you know, space and place and does that affect the how and the why and the what of what we're looking at. But also then moving from that grounded perspective to um, an interesting, I'm working on a project at the moment, and my collaborator have said, oh, 
you, you pull us out to the bigger picture. You take this empirical work on uh, subprime lending and you connect it up to these bigger ba debates about social reproduction. And, oh, and we wouldn't, you know, it's not a, a, a step that they would maybe be comfortable with or they would be much more driven by things they can confidently talk about given the constraints of, you know, modeling exercises or finding particular lending data. So I think it is this combination of being interested in the grounded, the particular, but then also moving from that to broader understandings of sort of bigger so what questions and what does is, what is this empirical reality have to do with bigger debates about transitions or various forms of economy? Okay. Britta, that, that certainly resonates with things you were saying a moment ago about providing that, that bigger picture. But Henry suggested there that sometimes these exchanges are somewhat asymmetric. We're, we may be w well read um, because we engage with and read other people's work, but not all, it's not always the case that the people with whom we're engaging read the kinds of things that, that we're writing and, and, and working with. So somewhat there's an asymmetric uh, nature to this relationship. I wonder if that, that jives with your experience. I think that's not something I could totally contradict. <laughs> but I guess when we do work with people from outside academia, um, we, they are often interested in what we have to say, but they don't necessarily read what we do. But they like to talk to us, and, and, and that's why conversation is important, and not only writing and meeting these people and doing stuff together. I mean, that's really an important issue if you want to be heard in the world outside academia. Within academia, if you if you talk about other uh, about scientists from other disciplines, it really depends on what what you. If you have something to say, for example, about gender issues in local development or renewable energies, then your stuff will be read and it will be cited. But uh, yeah, you have to kind of make an effort to advertise it in the right journals, and that's not necessarily economic geography or even geography journals, but that could be journals that are totally different, that are more practically oriented. Like in the energy um, world, it's energy policy is really an important journal, which is read internationally, both by practitioners and by, um, by academics. And you really have to choose carefully the your outlets and the way you you try to, to, to transport your knowledge. And it's not always through writing, but it's also through a lot through interaction. And maybe, yeah, there's also some new ways which uh, are po made possible by new media, which I haven't explored myself so much yet. I, I would like us to, to talk about uh, modes of communication and audience, and we'll, we'll come to that. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is, is to come to everyone in the room and say what we've heard here is a set of grounded experiences from people and I'm interested to know whether it resonates with your own experience, whether there are things that you would like to put on the table as based, based on your own, um, your own engagement with others, those who don't think of themselves as economic geographers but who, with whom you found working hopefully very productive. We have some roving mics so it will go around. Thank you. Um, my name is Rolf Schunze. I'm working for Litsumika in, um, in Japan. I do workshops with uh, managers. Um, initially, my own uh, inability to adjust to Japanese society, um, I was uh, asking what is needed to, be to become culturally competent and work with Japanese together. And uh, this led me to uh, research on uh, European management in Japan. I did then uh, American and Chinese recently, mostly, most of them they are entrepreneurs. And uh, I call them into workshops and uh, make them interacting uh, with our students and uh, really uh, get a lot of um, information about the individual. So we have a panel survey, not only one snapshot, but uh, I can understand their history, uh, meeting them um, not only at their company, but uh, inviting them to uh, our university and uh, making them uh, giving presentation in front of the students or uh, have some workshops on talent management with them or corporate um, corporate uh, governance or corporate social responsibility, uh, addressing such things. Uh, um, I also advertise to society the outcomes, and uh, this is really uh, um, appreciated, not okay. only by the managers thank, involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, other, other observations? 
I guess one of the things I'm interested in knowing is what, what, do we, what do we think of as our trump card as economic geographers when we engage with others? What is it that we bring to the table? I mean, in my own, my own research, I found it more and more important to understand myself what it is I'm bringing to the party. Hopefully, I'm bringing something. Um, and it's often, I would say, something that's it's not, a it's not a knowledge of something as a technical object. Right. If I'm working on finance, which I don't do, I'm not understanding that I can't uh, finance as a, a technical object. I'm not there because that's what I know. I tend to think I'm there because I've got a perspective. I'm wondering what your experiences are. How do you articulate what it is you bring to the party when you engage with people who don't characterize themselves as part of this tribe? Thank you. Thanks. If, if I'm allowed to just ask a, a slightly different question um, and perhaps ask the panel um, what their experiences are of um, contributing, say, uh, normative positions or clear um, political um, positions when working in, say, interdisciplinary teams. You know, sometimes our pluralism are open to um, multiple perspectives. Um, positions of, uh, of critique. Certainly in my own work I found that a challenge when asked to, maybe it's just me, but to communicate a very clear position from somewhere in the context of, of perhaps a contentious political issue or, or, or debate. So I'm interested in what the panel um, have experienced in that respect in terms of challenges of bringing sort of multiple geographical positions and yeah. perspectives. Jane, do you want to? Um, uh, good question. I think um, in terms of most of my uh, collaborations, I have tended to be, um, I've, I've tended to be working with people who've been interested in uh, uh, whatever, I'm often in sort of picking the projects and collaborating, there's been something, you know, quite empirical that initially drives the interest. And I've tended to be in collaborations where um, I've been with people who are similarly interested in uh, and have, have quite similar positions on why something looks particularly interesting. So I haven't found myself, I don't think, in a position where, um, or communicating with an audience where I've felt particularly uncomfortable about needing to either be more sort of strident or clear or less, um, less fuzzy about my conclusions. But that also, I think, is a product of, you know, a lot of my dissemination has been academic. It has been to other geographers. It has been in various disciplinary journals. And um, I know other colleagues who've done much more dissemination work with different kinds of audiences that expect um, and are very explicit about, you know, very different kinds of formats in which um, you would communicate things. So. I have, I have very little by way of experience of feeling uncomfortable with, with how, I, how I'm, or, or feeling I'm being pressured to represent my work in a particular way, but I don't know the other panel members. I, I, had, I had an experience where I did feel very uncomfortable, and that was when this working group on the energy transition in Germany was asked to, 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 to sketch up some recommendations, and I was very, very nervous because everybody was from different fields, a lot of practitioners were there, and I was not quite sure whether we would be able to write something together. And actually, it worked out quite well in the end, although the process was very hard and tedious. And it was, it was a lot about discussing things and trying to find a way to get something on paper, which would be the final goal, have a piece of paper which sounds like recommendations or which are recommendations. In the end, what helped was just sitting down and writing stuff and, and distributing it back and forth between us and having discussions in between and kind of trying to find a common denominator or be tolerant. If you don't agree with something but the others are more expert than you are, you just let it go through. And I mean, that's probably the way to go. It's just, the best way is just to go and start and do stuff and maybe try to phrase things in a way that they are not too definite. I mean, if, if, if you really have, um, if you have disagreements that are very fundamental. And, but or, or you should just, you should just uh, explicitly state them, say there's two, two, two opinions in our group. This one, we, one would pursue that way and the other one this way. But personally, when I give talks and I have been invited to plenaries about energy transition, I, I, I'd give them my opinion on things. I mean, 
Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm based in academia and I don't know all the practical things, but I have a general view on things and I didn't see that as a problem. The problem is if you have to agree with others and you have to write things down. I mean, that's, that's a challenge, but it's worth doing. Although I was really very much afraid and I didn't like to, to go into the process. Afterwards, I have to say it was worth the effort. Okay, thank you. Can I make a comment? I think uh, Eric's question is important, but I think we, we are now sort of sh shifting constantly between we uh, as academic economic geographers uh, work with academics in other disciplines, that's one kind of global encounters. Uh, the other kind will be with the normative world in, in the explicit sense of the world. I think you mean policy communities uh, and or those with a political angle, if you like. I don't go for election, yeah? Um, so, but that kind of encounters will be, will be very different. Right? So that's not about publishing in the TIBG, all right? That community, it's about speaking clearly the message that the question in your question. So um, I, I, I don't want to comment further yet until we are quite clear which way we want to go or we will do both. Alex, if, if I may, if I come, come back to you, I mean, is, is the suggestion that, I mean, that these normative issues are, need to be worked out early on in a research process um, because they, they precondition the type of work that it's possible to do? Or has your experience been that, that these get that they emerge fairly relatively late on in, in the research and therefore become either obstacles to further inquiry or things that can be quite productive to work through together. I'm just interested in what your experience has been. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I would agree with Henry's last comment about sort of making that distinction to a certain extent at least between sort of interdisciplinary work in a an academic context and then policy or other sort of engagements and practice out there in the real world. Um, yeah, I'm not necessarily suggesting a kind of a priori sort of you know con conviction about yeah. sort of normative statements before research takes place. Not necessarily. Um, I think um, sometimes I think some of the, the challenges I'm maybe kind of speaking to are, are in the more sort of policy domain um, where a particular sort of position is sometimes asked for or I've, or I've found myself in the position of um, being expected to be an advocate for a particular position where actually the research was coming out of, of uh, critique and requiring more sort of grounded research. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I, I don't have any kind of sort of strong sort of suggestions either one way or another but I think I suppose if, if I were to frame the question in larger terms it's what does the sort of heterodox economic geography mean for um, the ways in which we engage as economic geographers um, not only in an academic context but also in, in policy worlds as well. I think just to pick up on that um, yeah, I think that the crucial thing is um, the kind of the research project we're doing. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I occupy a position of privilege. I, I have a, a vaguely stable job in a Russell Group university in the UK, and I, can, I have a lot of autonomy over what kinds of research I do and what kinds of questions I'm interested in asking. Um, we were in a session the other day where I know Jamie Peck was talking about the... Um, the radically shifting landscape of um, working with policy communities who actually now, what they're looking for if you take their shilling is they want um, you know, a policy-based form of evidence that you know, allows them, to, it gives them ammunition to advocate a position that's already been taken. So the question is, in, in doing your economic geography, are you in a position where you get to choose whether, you know, is that the kind of work you need to do to, are you in a unit where you have to produce consulting income that pays your salary? to keep you going as an economic geographer, or do you get the luxury of saying, well, actually, I don't need to touch that kind of, um, that kind of work. I had that, the choice of you know, deciding my questions and deciding um, the boundaries of what I do. So I think that is another issue which takes us into sort of institutional waters about the, the organization of um, how we do economic geography in its own uh, institutional political economy. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is move to uh, some discussion around the issue of audience and communication. So it strikes me that um, there's an underpinning question to 
as we, as we in, encounter a range of other people through the work that we do, there's always the question of who are we trying to reach? Who are we trying to inform? Who are we trying to get to understand the way that we see the world? So that question of, of whom our audience is and how we get our concepts and ideas to travel seems to be a very pertinent <coughs> issue. And I was struck by the session just previous to this on visualization, for example, and experimentation with new visual methodologies and ways of communication in ways that get um, ideas and ways of visioning and understanding the world to move outside of academia. And in particular contexts that, that value the, uh, the impact that our academic work has, it seems that crafting objects, cultural objects, film, forms of visualization that then move outside of academia very readily and are taken up seems to increasingly be central to the type of enterprise that we're engaged in. So what I want to do is ask our, um, our conversationalists here questions about their uh, types of audience, that whom they're trying to reach. And I'd like to start with you, Henry, because I mean, one of the things that strikes me is, and you've mentioned it yourself, is the way in which your work over time has tried to reach a broader audience. Um, I wonder if you could speak to that a little. Okay. Thank you, Gavin. I think when, when, when I said I want to reach the wider audience, I, I mean primarily academic audience. So I will withhold the part about policy community and, uh, and everybody else, if you like. Okay, I, uh, for those of you who know me, I, uh, I was born in China, grew up in Hong Kong, lived in Singapore, Singaporean, so I have a very strong conviction, which is, I'm afraid to say, right in the center, to decenter Anglo-American economic geography. Now I speak again in the center now, in this building, okay? I want to decenter this stuff. So how do I do it? I live in the periphery, right? Well, Singapore is not quite periphery, but kind of. So, um, first we of course hold the first global conference on economic geography to, to start the ball rolling and thank you Derek for doing a wonderful, wonderful job of continuing this thing in the center. Uh, so my audience is, it's got to be academic. Uh, we are interested in using our work on Asia in, in showing case how new concepts, understanding can be developed. Yeah, need not be Silicon Valley or somewhere in, uh, in the Scandinavian countries. I'm looking at our friends. Okay, so for the kind of work I do on global production networks, we try to use it to understand economic development. The audience I want to engage are outside, not just in geography, but also outside geography, prim primarily to do with uh, development studies, certain kind of economic sociology, international political economy, um, regional studies, uh, comparative politics, and Asian studies broadly conceived. Um, the way of doing it is to capture their most important sort of uh, outlets, which is to, to be able to publish our work in their places. Because again, they do not read the transactions of the Institute of British Geographers, because only geographers do. No, I'm just kidding. But by and large, I mean, well, I did to other journals. I have done citation analysis of our economic geography and environment planning, hey, and I know who reads our stuff. Um, so we need to reach out to that. And how do you do that? And, and we have spoken quite extensively with our friends, I mean, in a global value chain, you know, in sociology, in development studies, and so on. I've done some citation analysis again. It's quite clear that we are able to make some significant impact within our field in geography, published in the leading journals, da 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 da. Uh, but we are unable to reach out to, if you like, the kind of upper echelon in the kind of equivalent, equivalent view elsewhere. So what I would like to do is to be able to continuously engaging those audience. Uh, it entails basically much harder, more work. Let me, let me just push you a bit on that. So think, think, thinking about uh, the work that you and Neil have been doing recently on the GPN 2.0, so a, uh, a rethinking of the Global Production Networks framework. And one of the things that strikes me about what GPN 2.0 looks like is it's streamlined. It's slimmed down. It's got a narrower set of variables in it, if you like. And I'm wondering to what extent is that a strategic decision on your part, and, and with Neil and other people working in this area, that that's what it takes to get GPN to travel beyond geography? Yeah, I, I mean, Neil is there, so I should un send him to answer all the questions. <laughs> Um, actually, there is one thing that we need to do, which I really want to push again here. We need to write more books, good, solid books, very focused, 
in this case, the book that we wanted to write in this time was theoretical. I prepared some documents here. We're in Oxford. If you look at David Harvey, I mean, all his wonderful books in the 1980s was published by John Davy, then the editor at Blackwell. Yeah? After John Davy left, those of you old enough or older than me know that Harvey no longer published that kind of stuff. All right? His condition of postmodernity limits to capital were John Davy products. So goes to Manuel Castell's work. And today, and I know again I'm speaking in the center where REF dominates everything. Uh, research excellence, oh, what was that? REF, how to spell, I can't remember. RAE, yes. Um, is that we don't write that many books in geography now. Um, and the point is because uh, audience elsewhere don't necessarily read our leading journals, but when it comes to books, they read. And hence, we wanted to do the GPN 2.0 and with the view that it's not just meant for adoption within economic geography, but to change the ways in which business school guys study what they call the slicing chains or in poly science. So we have to build in some of the political considerations and so on and so forth. So it's in that spirit. Okay. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, so uh, Britta, I'm wondering if, I mean, what we've heard from Henry there is a, 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 a very clear um, forensic appraisal of what it takes for to get academic work to travel beyond geography and a, um, a, a mode of approach that's very strategic and very clear about this is what it's going to need for us to do in order to have these ideas move outside of our comfort zone. Does that resonate with, with the kind of things that you're doing or do, I mean, do you find um, that uh, have you been as strategic in your approach to getting your ideas to, to travel to maybe to the policymakers with whom you work in your working group in, in Hanover? Um, it's kind of a difficult question because I have a totally different take on that question. When okay. it comes to uh, having our, our, our results travel to audiences outside academia, I mean academia clearly, you go to conferences, you present papers, you try to publish in, in international journals to be seen, I mean that's natural. But um, for our knowledge and the knowledge that we produce to travel to, to wider audiences, I would see teaching as one of the first avenues. And I'm kind of wondering that this hasn't been mentioned because I mean, I don't know if you teach as much in other countries as we do, but I have like 20 to 30 graduates per year that did their master's thesis or bachelor's thesis with me. I, have a, I teach like 10 hours per week. So I have a lot of contact with young people who are going out into the world. We train them to work in public administration and private enterprises and often also in intermediaries between the two. And we need good and reflecting people in these uh, jobs. And we as geographers, have a lot to win if we could give them a good education and they kind of uh, keep tuned w with what is happening in geography. And there are certain journals which wouldn't be the, the peer-reviewed journals, but there's other journals that might, they might read, which we could be provide an outlet to kind of keep in contact with them and get our knowledge out into the world. So I see there's a very great importance of study project and other forms of teaching that supports interaction with the outside world, which is also giving um, our knowledge to those people that we work with, often trained in geography. And we also need to keep in contact with our graduates because they are outside there, they can, they can enrich our research. I mean, I have done several interviews now, expert interviews with former students of mine, which are now in energy business or financial or whatever things, so that's really interesting. And then also the contact we have with practitioners in, in our research is also important. I mean, this is all very low level, but I think that's where, where, where things can be changed in society. And writing books, I think, is very good. And then I, don't, I don't mind that at all. But um, expecting to people who make decisions on issues that have an, an impact on the welfare of, of, of the society, yeah, it's a very um, upper tier approach. And, and I would... I, yeah, sure, Can sure. I jump in now? It's more conversational. We, yeah, we sure. plan that we may beat each other, but in this case, maybe not yet, not reach that level of heat. Um, I think we're talking about different things. You see, here I'm talking about influencing our fellow academics in other fields elsewhere in such a way so that when they teach their students, they teach with our stuff in mind. That's what I mean. I don't mean we don't want to... I do whatever you have just said. But that's another part of the story. By the way, I've always told our faculty members in NUS Geography or elsewhere, is that we get paid to teach, but we stay sane by doing research. You don't get paid to do research. You get paid to teach. Teaching is fundamental. I do teach, unless Professor Dr. Neil Cole give me less teaching. 
So, so what I would conclude is that we really need to, to strike a good balance between different types of outlets, which is teaching, talking to practitioners, publications, presentations, not only in high-ranked academic journals, but maybe some, somewhere else. And what I was interested in in one of the questions that we were posed is about the, about the new methods and creativity. I mean, that was also part of the question now. And, I have to say, I mean, as a good German, I'm very suspicious, suspicious of potential, the potential for supervision and control that is entailed in all these new media stuff, and also in the ways that it speeds up our lives and leaves less, spe less space and time for critical in-depth research, but I guess we will have to engage with these things. I mean, as topics of our research, but maybe also as avenues to get our research across. It's just, we should do that very cautiously and think about, well, the, 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 the um, it has to be a correspondence between the format and the target groups, but also between the effort and the output or the impact. I mean, and that's kind of a difficult question for me to, to answer right now. I mean, that's something that needs to be explored. Thank you, Britta. Um, so, Jane, who do, you, who do you want to reach with your work? Um, a lot, I, I suspect a lot of the time I, my work is read by other geographers um, of, different, of different ilks. Although, from talking to various collaborators, my sense is that they do read geography journals. They may not be citing uh, transactions as, as, as highly as li we like, but my sense is that they do um, read economic geographical work. And I know, again, there's this debate about do we, do we have to take our, our work to the journals of elsewhere, which I think is, is good practice if we do that, but also how do we get people to read geography journals? And I know um, from sitting in an AAG session about uh, the Journal of Economic Geography, where Neil uh, Wrigley was talking, and, he, and he's got the this endless question about the relationship between geography and economics, this, this really hard to negotiate boundary, but a really important boundary. And he, uh, he said, you know, the journal, he said, wasn't as so much about confronting economics, it was about weaving webs around it and establishing readerships in parts of economics, parts of management, business studies. And I, I thought that was actually quite a good metaphor about a strategy for how you can set up a journal and you think about engaging a wider audience and making them perhaps come to you know, some of our shared terrain with economics rather than necessarily always feeling we have to go um, to their journals. I thought that was an interesting um, issue in what is a very, very difficult to, uh, to navigate uh, boundary. Um, yes, I think it would be nice if um, economic geographers are writing more books, but as um, and again, it's a particular UK quirk, although it's now becoming more internationalized. We have a political economy of what is valued and what kinds of outputs we are supposed to encourage our junior colleagues to produce, which has not had a good impact on the production of books. Or books are things that are good to do if you have your, uh, all your other ducks lined up in terms of the publications you need to submit for audit. So um, it can be a risky strategy uh, in your career to focus on doing a brilliant book and then not having enough uh, publications to be entered into an audit exercise. And however crazy and bonkers that sounds, uh, it is crazy and bonkers and it, it has had, a, I think, a pernicious influence in various ways. And then you get into debates about how different kinds of subject panels who are involved in these audits value books and we may be actually be relatively lucky in geography compared to some other subject areas where in economics, again, it's very much about your journal articles rather than um, production of books. So again, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to think about these questions in isolation from the conditions in which we're asked to produce these outputs and to have these conversations. And we know the conversations are important, but there are also all sorts of limits on how and in what conditions we have those conversations and the, what luxuries and what room for maneuver we have in um, who we talk to and how we talk to. So in the UK at the moment, we now have this thing called an impact agenda, which means it's sort of code for policy-related work, showing that your work makes a difference to constituencies beyond academia. But for a lot of people, that will be seen as yet more to do in their workload, in addition to doing the academic outputs that satisfy the people looking over there. There's now people looking over here saying, well, You've got your transactions article, where's your policy output? And it's, you know, it's very much about the intensification of a, a labor process in academia as well, I think, for a lot of people. May I just make a brief remark, but remark about that? Because what I think is if we really think that these new um, modes of, of controlling and regulating us are not 
conducive to good research, then we should fight them in some ways. And I don't know why, I, I don't know how and, and, and how to put it up. But if we think it would be worth it letting people, giving people time to write books, and there's a lot of, I mean, for some people that is probably the best output they can have. I mean, if you look at some of the German, some German great thinkers in social science like Habermas, Luhmann, and so on and so forth. I mean, they wrote books, they hardly ever wrote any articles. And it was good that they had the time. And with the, with the new conditions, which, haven't been, which are not as bad in Germany as they are in the UK, but we are moving in the same direction, there is something um, becoming lost which, which makes academic life not only attractive, but also productive and, and so, having a good impact on society. And that's something that we definitely need to think about, not only within economic geography, but within geography and academia in general, if we really want to sub, uh, how do you say, subdue to, to all these things, or how, how, how there is a way to make it, to fight it or to, to change it in a way that it makes more sense. Perhaps I could just jump in, because I think it's certainly possible to interpret the impact uh, agenda as a process of intensification. But it does also create opportunities because actually, as I think as, as, a, as a group of, as a subdiscipline of geography, it is one area we're actually quite good at doing. There's lots of good examples of people who do engage beyond academic inquiry and make interventions in um, policy relevant and other debates um, that are quite significant. And I'm just wondering if people in the room have experiences of, of doing that and see in um, particular sets of questions that are out there that may be regarded as having social significance, um, opportunities for economic geography to engage. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. So consultancy with the World Bank, DFID, etc., would be an obvious other channel. So, sorry, just to make, make sure I've understood, you're suggesting areas of, of consultancy as an area of, of, of work in which economic geography may, economic geographers and their concepts and tools may be valued? Is that what I'm... That? No, it's, it's an area, of, it's another channel for influence uh -huh. and for, uh -huh. yeah, for influence uh -huh. through consultancy. I think this sorry, is... Sorry, was that your question? It was about, indeed, yeah. it was indeed. No, yeah. but, but I'm also thinking thematically. So I'm thinking, you know, economic geography obviously uh, has often been criticised of missing the boat, Peter Dickens' uh, our, our argument that we, we kind of miss the big issues that are out there. And I actually don't think that's entirely fair, and I think we can make a case that actually economic geography has been quite successful at identifying particular boats and piloting them and making contributions. But I, I guess what I was thinking of was thematically, are there particular areas of inquiry in which we think we have something to say and uh, can make significant interventions. I'm particularly interested in people's experience of that um, and where you see opportunities that perhaps in your view are not currently yet being realized. Good, I'll leave that to someone else, thank you. <laughs> well, let me get to a type of audience uh, which has not been mentioned uh, so far, but uh, which poses uh, Im very important potential for collaboration. Uh, I'm a professor at the Technical University of Aachen, which is a heavily engineering dominated uh, uh, institution of higher education. And uh, I see myself increasingly involved in collaborating with engineering scientists. And um, being an economic geographer, uh, I think it's so important uh, dealing with questions of innovation, technology development, to really deal with those who are actually doing these technologies. Um, so um, we, we have a bit of problems of understanding, but uh, well, at least on a small scale, I managed to make my engineering colleagues understand that economic geography is an important partner in doing research. And let me uh, give a certain topic as an example. Uh, in Germany, we just have this paradigm shift in production technology towards industry 4.0, which means uh, in the future, um, in engineering is focusing on cyber-physical systems, everything's controlled by the internet, and uh, there will be major changes in how uh, industries collaborate. And there are actually, well, the engineers are thankful to economic geographers, helping them understand the impact this will have and the implications uh, associated with the shift. So I think that's an important field we should definitely uh, target in more strategic terms in the future. 
That's interesting because I, I, I know my, my own work on energy. I encounter people who come from engineering training and engineering background, and to some extent, the debate over energy has traditionally been framed in engineering terms. Mm -hmm. um, but I think issues of energy infrastructure have kind of slipped those moorings in engineering and increasingly being uh, debated and thought about through the social sciences. And that's often a, a tricky encounter because our understandings of, of how the system is constituted, uh, what the system is for, uh, what the uh, metrics of success in the system should be are very different. I'm just wondering in your experience, do you in those, in working with engineers, do you kind of work through those things or do they kind of get glossed over until particular points down the chain where they really kind of erupt? So I've had both experiences in, in work that I've done. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure if I get your question, uh, I understood your question right, but um, uh, I think it's a, it's a grill process of establishing some mutual interest in the work of others. Uh, but I find myself learning so much from their work and I especially have collaborated with people in the uh, t textile um, um, mechanical engineering uh, field. And uh, it made me really uh, get a new perspective on things we should look at in working in economic geography, and it also the other way around. Okay. So it will be a sustainable collaboration going on into the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all, this has been really interesting. I guess, I, very briefly, I mean, one thing I think about, when I think about sort of what we already do, but maybe how we could take it a little bit further, is the whole idea, and this, riffs off of some of uh, the recent papers Jamie's written about island life and the dialogues and things, which have been really interesting in the Palanian substantivist project. But, but thinking about like variegations of capitalism and the forms of capitalism, but taking that further in relation to the critical issues of the day. So inequality, I think we could do a lot more on the issue of inequality in all its forms. I think also climate, climate change. I mean, we're already doing this to some degree, but I think a more concerted project, because that's really going back to the strengths question. I mean, I think we, that our strength is in being able to identify the spatial variations and variegations of capitalism in all its forms around the planet. But we need to put that, I would suggest, to work in relation to these really pressing issues, particularly around issues of inequality and development and, and, uh, and, and, and in the environment. And I think that, to me, is where I think we could go a lot further. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I think another very important um, field for consultancy or for introducing economic uh, geographic expertise is uh, the whole field of uh, labor markets and uh, labor market regulation. Uh, I just give you two brief examples. Uh, one example is um, the uh, increasing um, yeah, the, the, the increase of boundaryless careers. So, so the traditional employee status is, is decreasing in almost all countries all over the world and uh, there's a, um, there are new desires for, for creating resilience on labor markets and uh, uh, there's a lot of, lot of um, yeah, uh, interest from, from political side but also from, from those who, who live as freelancers for instance or who, who, do, uh, who work on changing labor markets and who, who invest a lot of unpaid labor in order to promote their career um, yeah, to create new institutions that provide some security in this field. And I think this is an, a very interesting, uh, and very interesting area for doing research, but also for doing consultancy. And another thing uh, with regards to labor markets is um, in Germany we have uh, kind of the challenges of demographic change. Uh, so decreasing populations and in increasing uh, age and so on. And this leads to very particular, regionally particular, challenges with respect to how to get qualified labor in these regions and uh, uh, the federal ministry of uh, labor in Germany realizes that it's not no longer possible to, to govern these uh, things top down for the whole nation state in a unified way. So what do they do? They promote uh, regional networks that uh, create regionally specific solutions in different regions and there's also a very nice field for, for introducing economic geography uh, expertise here. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Is it at the back there. Uh, I, I think we haven't spoken yet about 
what is perhaps quite an obvious point, and that is the amplification of audience, the amplification of impact can occur th through working with the media. Uh, the media are always looking for information. They're always looking for uh, a new point of view. And uh, a number of geographers uh, have been involved, I'm thinking of Chris Hamnett over the years, uh, in writing op-eds uh, in national newspapers. Uh, once, once the media know your name, they keep coming back to you. As I once heard an editor say, rather surprising comment, he said, my journalists are all lazy. Uh, once they've got their, their list of uh, experts, they constantly go back to them. So it, once, you, once you've broken through into uh, a media connection, uh, in a sense, the impetus is on their side. Uh, and they do keep coming back, uh, and it is a wonderful way to uh, take the message to a very much broader audience. That suggests then that one of the areas, if, if we're interested in our ideas traveling, that it's not just about designing new objects through which that can happen, it's also about investing in those personal networks, and particularly with uh, those who work in, in media as a way to do that. I noticed there was a question behind you. I'm actually from uh, media and communication, so I want to follow up on this. And uh, uh, there are different kinds of media. Okay, if you got lots of interview from the Daily Telegraph, from probably you know, other the, the Daily Mail will, or the Daily I think it's called the Daily Mail will interview you less, <laughs> or you know the, 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 so uh, uh, in in communication and media study we call it multimodal communication. Yeah. So if uh, you really have uh, some really important message. Okay, I think the uh, uh, you know the, the first thing. Okay, this is actually my first geography conference. I want to thank the organizers for having me here. I'm learning a lot. There are lots of really really good content here that deserve media attention. Okay? But then how can so the the uh, once we have the good content, then we need to study. Okay, I think there's a whole school of you know, theories about how can we, we need to be audience-centered. So far, the discussion in, in this part is very much about how can we communicate to them. Okay, but it, uh, before we talk about how can we communicate to them, them be the media or uh, other uh, colleagues in other disciplines or policymakers, we need to study the way they communicate, the way they think, okay, before we make any coherent strategy. And, uh, and then uh, uh, I can, you know, in a very oversimplifying way to summarize, the, the, there are certain media and there are certain audiences that are very busy. And I want to call them, uh, following Henry's, okay, decentering, uh, okay, uh, uh, you know, uh, gesture, okay, to call them northern audiences and southern audiences. Okay, so so there, are in the, in the, there are media who are very busy, okay, you have to compete for the sound bite, yeah. which, which really good scholars usually are not very good at. Okay. But yeah. then there are people in the global south who, who, who want to hear from us, but then we are ignoring them. So I, I think it's a, there's a huge uh, you know, audience in the global south, and I really look forward to the next one in Cologne, because it sounds like there are more global south scholars there. And then if we can learn the way the, the southern populations, southern media, southern Policymakers, I think there's a huge, uh, you know, market hungry, you know, to learn Thank from you. this conference. Thank you very much. An important uh, corrective there for us to think about the differentiated nature of media. Not all media is equal. So thank you very much for that. Um, just like to turn to my colleagues here and see whether you would like to react to anything you've heard there. We're, we've got a couple of minutes really before we need to draw this to a close. So interested in any uh, reflections or comeback you've had from things you've heard. Maybe I take it on first. Um, I think, again, I mean, we, we come from very diverse um, national or regional um, backgrounds, so um, I do recognize that we, we have very different, if you like, repertoire resources from where we come from, as well as the interaction with faculty members. And I assume most of us are from universities, but some of us are from research institutes, and so on and so forth. So that's the backdrop. We are a very diverse group of people here. But what I'm going to talk about briefly is my own position as an, uh, what, what do we call it in NUS, a kind of a research teaching track faculty member who has a permanent job until 
currently 65 years old and, uh, and reasonably well resourced and um, to do what I want to do. Yeah? From that position, I can make a choice. Right? I can make a choice to be answering media calls every day, which I can, but what's the point? Because when they call you up, they will like immediate answers and they only quote you one line. And you know, in geography, you always give complex answers, contextualized nuance, da 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 da. By the time you finish, the other side, they already put down the phone and wrote down that one line. Professor Henry Young from NUS said that uh, the ruling party is terrible. <laughs> what? Did I say that? Maybe, but it's, you know, the point I want to make is that I'm sorry. I'm not interested in influencing this group of people. Anyway, they were my, our students. They were our students, the reporters, okay? I'm very interested in advancement of knowledge. That's what I do. I want to do it well. I want to do it very, very well. And I thought today's purpose is about encountering the other kind of people who do knowledge advancement outside economic geography. Who are they? In the other branches of social sciences. I mean, Martina, you want to engage your engineers? Well, I mean, I don't want to engage our engineers because they rule us anyway. They, I mean, our big boss is all engineering, so I hate them. <laughs> the point is, we are not German manufacturers, so you know, the, our engineers heck care economic geographers, so to speak. So I'm very interested in our immediate neighborhood, which is social sciences. By that, I mean including business school, including law, and so on, yeah? So it's on that basis I said what I said earlier. Whether we want to do consultancies like in business school, sure we can. But I mean, that's again depending on your specific context. In my case, I'm sorry, I'm well paid enough that I don't want to do any consultancy because it takes time. And when they send me a call for whatever proposal, you have to answer in one week. I don't have one week. We take years to write things. We can't do things in one week. So I'm sorry, that's me. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. Just to pick up on that, I think. I think the, the questions that are raised about media are really good and, and maybe there will be a sort of generational shift as well in, in the use of different technologies and putting out our message. But I think this issue of, yeah, do we, yeah, I, I get journalists and, and, and on the phone and emails, you know, can you give us a story, we, you know, we're doing a story at four o'clock on X in the northeast, can you come? And, and it is very difficult with that, but I think, and going back to a, a sort of Alex's uh, point earlier, uh, I think there is a role where I think we could get a lot better at deciding when, we, you know, when we've done our projects on our terms and we feel we have a very important message, I think there's all sorts of ways in which we could more strategically engage with media and be very savvy about you know, which outlets we use, what we get out there. And I think though that in, in, in my working environment that would involve a research centre of people that have different skill sets and certainly it's broader range of skill sets than I have. So I could, I could sort of envisage a, a, a group of economic geographers who, you know, some of them are, are maybe more specialized at doing research, but others are more specialized in communication, engagement, and having, you know, building capacity where you have people with diverse skill sets who the, the net result is that you are able to represent a project in ways that you feel comfortable with, but also to, to be able to you know, do more than just meet the four o'clock deadline for a journalist that's, that has a deadline. So I think um, there's an awful lot we could do to, to work better with media and, and smarter with media, but I do think it's also different skill sets than a lot of um, academics have. And I think it's maybe about, you know, in, a re in, a, in my fantasy of a better resource world, having or maybe thinking strategically and saying, right, we're gonna have to employ different kinds of people in teams who are committed to this project. And some of us, we have a sort of division of labor about doing the project and then uh, the getting it out there. Thank you, Jane. Britta? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree with both of you. I agree when we should, we should concentrate on our research in many ways. And I would not want to do any market-based consultancy as a professor or as a researcher at a university. That should not be the case because that's not what we are there for. And I also think that we should advance our use of new media 
which I hope that we will get more support from our universities in the future, so we don't have to get that expert knowledge about how to do it ourselves, and then we can make decisions whether we want to use it or whether we don't want to use it. But I think there's another point that I find important, and that, that is that we also engage maybe more actively with our regional and especially our institutional environments that we are in. So meaning our departments, our faculties, maybe our universities, and kind of try to see them also as a, as a source of inspiration for some stuff. And in the way that Martina was saying, I mean, it could be academically, but it's also, I think it's also important to think about the eco political economy of, of academia. And that could also be something we do research on or that we could apply our concepts to. And there's a lot of things that need to be discussed and probably also changed. But I mean, I guess we might disagree on that. And what I would find promising is if we, in addition to just talk about academic, academic issue, which was a great conference, and we did a lot, of, we, I mean, I, thanks to Derek again, that was a conference where we had a lot of what, what um, Barnes would have um, called engaged pluralism, but maybe we could extend beyond those topics that Jim, for example, mentioned, exactly the ones that had, I, I had on my list, that we also talk about the conditions under which we work and, and try to find out what is good, what is not so good, what would be better, and how can we get there if we agree at all. Okay, thank you very much. Well, this was an experiment. Thank you for being part of it. Um, I would like you to join with me in thanking uh, my three colleagues here for uh, their contribution and their comments.